they decided to die together. When one went, the other would go too. What was there to stay for? They had no furniture, so they asked Kamratovich, an old man who was also in exile, to fix them an adobe platform in a corner, which became their conjugal bed, beautifully wide and comfortable, perfect. They stuffed a big, broad sack with straw and sewed it up for a mattress. Next, they ordered a table from Kamratovich, a round one, into the bargain. Kamratovich was puzzled. Over sixty years he'd lived in this world, and he'd never seen a round table. Why make it round? Please, said Nikolai Ivanovich, rubbing his deft, white gynecologist's hands. It simply must be round. Their next problem was to get a hold of a paraffin lamp. They'd wanted a glass lamp, not a tin one. With a tall stand, the wick had to have ten strands, not seven, and they insisted on the spare globes, too. Since no such lamp existed in Ushtarek, it had to be assembled piecemeal, each part brought by kind people from a long way off. Finally, there stood the lamp, with its homemade shade on the round table. In Ushtarek, in the year 1954, when the hydrogen bomb was already invented and people were chasing after standard lamps in the capitals. This paraffin lamp on the round, homemade table transformed the little clay hovel into a luxurious drawing room of two centuries ago. What a triumph! As the three of them sat around it, Alina Alexandrovna would remark with feeling, You know, Oleg, life is so good. Apart from childhood, these have been the happiest days of my life. And obviously she was right. It is not our level of prosperity that makes for happiness, but the kinship of heart to heart and the way we look at the world. Both attitudes lie within our power, so that a man is happy, so long as he chooses to be happy. And no one can stop him. Before the war, they had lived near Moscow with her mother-in-law. She had been so uncompromising and obsessed by detail, and Nikolai Ivanovich had stood in such awe of her that Elena Alexandrovna had felt crushed. She was already a middle-aged woman with her own life to lead, and this wasn't her first marriage. She called those years her middle ages now. It would take some terrible disaster to let a gust of fresh air into that family. Disaster descended, and it was her mother-in-law who set the wheels turning. During the first year of the war, a man with no documents came to their door, asking for shelter. Her mother-in-law considered it her duty to give refuge to the deserter without even consulting the young couple. She combined sternness toward the family with general Christian principles. The deserter spent two nights in the flat and then left. He was captured somewhere and under interrogation revealed the house which had harbored him. The mother-in-law being nearly 80, they left her alone, but it was thought convenient to arrest her 50-year-old son and 40-year-old daughter-in-law. During the investigation, they tried to discover whether the deserter was a relative. Had he been, they'd have taken a far more lenient view of the case. A family, looking after its own, quite understandable, excusable even. But since he had been a mere passerby, nothing to them, the Codmans got ten years apiece. Not for harboring a deserter, but as enemies of their country, who were deliberately undermining the might of the Red Army. The war ended, and the deserter was released in Stalin's Great Amnesty of 1945. Historians will rack their brains, wondering why deserters should have been pardoned before anyone else, and unconditionally. He'd forgotten in whose house he'd spent two nights on the run, and he dragged others into prison after him. The Cadmans 
were not affected by the amnesty. They were enemies, not deserters. They'd served their ten years, but they were still not allowed to go home. After all, they hadn't acted as individuals. They were a group, an organization, husband and wife. Therefore, they must be exiled in perpetuity. Knowing in advance that this would happen, the Cadmans had made an application to be exiled to the same place. No one seemed to have any particular objection. The request was legitimate enough. All the same, they sent the husband to the south of Kazakhstan and his wife to the Krasnoyarsk region. Did they perhaps want to separate them as members of the same organization? No. It wasn't done out of malice or as a punishment, but simply because there was no one on the staff at the Ministry of the Interior whose job it was to keep husbands and wives together. So, they had stayed separated. The wife was nearly fifty, her arms and legs were swelling, yet they sent her out into the taiga, where the only work was lumberjacking. So, familiar with the camps, the asterisk next to the taiga, coniferous forest between the barren Arctic shores and the steppe. I still don't know how to pronounce that. Um, if anyone has any idea of the correct pronunciation, don't hesitate to type it. Yet, she often reminisced about the Yen Si Taiga, wonderful countryside. They spent a year bombarding Moscow with complaints until, in the end, a special guard was sent to bring Elena Alexandrovna out to Ushterek. Of course, they enjoyed life now. They loved Ushterek and their mud and clay hovel. What more could they wish for in the way of worldly goods? Perpetual exile? Very well. Perpetuity was long enough to make a thorough study of the climate of Ushterek. Nikolai Ivanovich hung there, thermometers outside his house, put out a jar to collect precipitation, and consulted Ina Strom, the senior schoolgirl in charge of the state weather station, about the force of the wind. By now, Nikolai Ivanovich had a journal full of meticulously kept statistics. Whatever happened to the weather station? His father had been a communications engineer. From him, he had imbibed in childhood a passion for constant activity and a love of order and accuracy, although no one could call Korolenko, a pedant, he had frequently observed, and Nikolai Ivanovich liked to quote his words, that order in affairs maintains peace of mind. Dr. Cadman's favorite proverb was, things know their place. Things know themselves where they belong, and we shouldn't get in their way. Asterisk next to Korolenko, a pre-revolutionary writer, Russian writer, popular among members of the intelligentsia, eager to serve the people. Nikolai Ivanovich's favorite hobby for winter evenings was bookbinding. He liked to take torn, tattered, wilting books and make them blossom anew in fresh covers. Even in Ushterek, he managed to have a binding press and an extra sharp guillotine made for him. As soon as the Cadmans had paid for the mud hut, they started economizing. They scraped month after month, wearing out old clothes to save up for a battery radio. First, they had to arrange with the Kurd, who was the assistant in the cultural goods store, to put some batteries on one side for them. Batteries came separate from the sets, if they came at all. Then, they had to overcome the horror that all exiles have of radios. What would the security officers say? Did they want the set for listening in to the BBC? The horror was overcome. The batteries were obtained, and the set was switched on. And out came music, sheer heaven to a prisoner's ear, with no disturbances, because the battery supplied an event current. Puccini, Sibelius, Borchansky were chosen daily from the programs and switched on in the Cadman's hovel. The radio filled their world, and more than filled it. They had no need now to take from the outside world. 
they could give from their own plenty. When spring came, there was less time in the evenings to listen to the radio. Instead, they had their own kitchen and garden to look after. Nikolai Ivanovich divided up his quarter-acre plot with such energy and ingenuity that old Prince Bolkonsky, with his private architect at Bald Hills Estates, would have had to run to keep up with him. Two asterisks next to Bolkonsky, a character from Tolstoy's War and Peace. At the age of 60, he was still going strong at the hospital, working time and a half and ready to rush out any night to deliver a baby. He never walked in the village. He rushed along with no concern for the dignity of his gray beard. The flaps of the canvas jacket Elena Alexandrovna had made fluttering behind him. When it came to digging, though, he hadn't the strength now. Half an hour in the morning was all he could manage before he was winded. Heart and hands might lag, yet the plan was masterly, barely short of perfection. Boastfully, he would take Oleg around his bare kitchen garden, the boundary carelessly marked by two saplings. Oleg, he would say, I'm going to have an avenue running through it. On the left here, there will be three apricot trees one day. They've already been planted. On the right, I'm going to start a vineyard. It'll take root, I'm sure of it. Then, at the end of the avenue, I'm going to put a summer house. A real summer house. Something Ushtrek has never seen the like of. I've already laid the foundations. Look, over there. The semicircle of adobes. Kamratovich would have asked, Why semicircle? And over here are the hop poles. I'll put tobacco plants next to them. They'll give off a wonderful smell. We'll hide from the heat of the day here. And in the evenings, we'll drink tea out of the samovar. In fact, they hadn't got it yet. You'll be welcome whenever you want. What their garden would grow one day was anybody's guess. But what it hadn't got to date, potatoes, cabbages, cucumbers, tomatoes, and pumpkins, their neighbors had. But you can buy all those things, the Cadmans would protest. The Ushtarek settlers were a businesslike lot. They kept cows, pigs, sheep, hens. The Cadmans were no strangers to livestock breeding either. But they farmed unpractically. They kept dogs and cats and nothing else. They saw it this way. You can get milk and meat in the bazaar, but where can you buy the devotion of a dog? Would lop-eared beetle, black and brown and big as a bear? Or sharp-nosed, pushing little tobic? White but for two quivering black ears, leap up to greet you for money? What the fuck does that mean? Sorry, I'm going to read that again and try and interpret it better. Uh, would lop-eared beetle, black and brown and big as a bear? or sharp-nosed, pushing little toe-beak, white but for two quivering black ears, leap up and greet you for money? Nowadays, we don't think much of man's love for animals. We laugh at people who are attached to cats. But if we stop loving animals, aren't we bound to stop loving humans too? The Cadmans loved their animals. Not for their fur, but for themselves. And the animals absorbed their owner's aura of kindness, instantly without any training. They deeply appreciated the Cadmans talking to them and could listen to them for hours. They valued their company and took pride in escorting them wherever they went. As soon as Tobik, lying in the room, the dogs had run up the house, saw Elena Alexandrovna putting on her coat and picking up her purse, he knew. They were going for a walk around the village, and what's more, would jump up, rush off into the garden to fetch Beetle, and be back with him in a trice. He had told Beetle about the walk in dog language, and up would run Beetle, excited and raring to go. Beetle was an excellent judge of time. After he had escorted the Cadmans 
to the movies, instead of lying down outside, he disappeared. But he was always back before the end of the program. Once there had been only five reels in the film, and he was late. He was miserable at first, but he jumped for joy after all had been forgiven. The dogs accompanied Nikolai Ivanovich everywhere except to work, for they realized that that wouldn't be very tactful. If they saw the doctor coming out of the gate with his light, youthful step late in the afternoon, they knew, unerringly, as if by telepathy, whether he was off to visit a woman in labor, in which case they stayed behind, or going for a swim, in which case they joined him. He used to swim in the Chu River, a good five kilometers away. Locals and exiles alike, young or middle-aged, considered it too far to go for a daily trip. But small boys went. So did Dr. Cadman and his dogs. Actually, this was the one walk that failed to give the dogs complete satisfaction. The track across the steppe was hard and thorny. Beetle's paws got painfully cut, while Tobik, who had once been ducked, was terrified of finding himself in the river again. But their sense of duty was paramount. They followed the doctor all the way. Once within 300 meters of the river, a safe distance, Tobik would begin to lag behind to make quite sure that nobody grabbed him. First, he would apologize with his ears, then with his tail, and then he sat down. But Beetle went right up to the sloping bank, planted his great body there, and like a monument, surveyed the people bathing below. Tobik extended his escort duties to cover Oleg, who was always at the Cadman's. So much so that the security officer became worried and interrogated them in turn. Why are you so friendly? What do you have in common? What do you talk about? Beetle had a choice in the matter, but Tobik had to escort Oleg, come rain or shine. When it was raining and the streets were muddy and his paws got cold and wet, he hated the idea of going out. He would stretch his forepaws, then his hind paws, but he'd go out all the same. Tobik also acted as a postman between Oleg and the Cadmans. If they wanted to let Oleg know that there was an interesting movie on, or a good program of music on the radio or something useful for sale in the grocery or the general store, they tied a cloth collar around Tobik with a message inside, pointed in the right direction, and announced firmly, Go to Oleg! Whatever the weather, off he would trot obediently on his long, stocky legs, and if he didn't find Oleg at home, he would wait by the door. It was extraordinary. Nobody had ever taught him. He wasn't trained to do it, but he understood instructions instantaneously, as if by thought waves, and carried them out. It has to be admitted, though, that on his postal trips, Oleg used to strengthen Tobik's ideological loyalty with some material incentive. What intrigued Oleg about Tobik were his permanently sad eyes. He never smiled with his teeth, only with his ears. Beetle was about the size and build of a German shepherd, but he had none of the shepherd's wariness or malice. He overflowed with the good-heartedness of most large, powerful creatures. He had lived a fair number of years and known many owners. But the Cadmans he had chosen himself. Before that, he had belonged to Vasadze, a tavern keeper who had kept him on a chain to guard the crates of empties. Sometimes, for a joke, he unleashed him and set him on other neighbors' dogs. A doughty fighter, Beetle struck terror into the flabby yellow street dogs, but in fact he was a kindly and peace-loving fellow. On one of the occasions when he was let loose, he attended a dog's wedding near the Cadman's. The local dogs had all been wooing. Dolly, Tobik's mother, Beetle had been rejected because of his ludicrous size, and so never became Tobik's stepfather. He sensed sincerity and kindness in the Cadman's house, 
and garden and began to frequent them, although they never fed him. Then Vasadsi left the village and gave Beetle to Amelia, an exiled girlfriend of his. Although she gave Beetle plenty to eat, he kept breaking free and going to the Cadmans. Amelia got quite cross with them. She took Beetle back to her house and chained him up again, but he still kept breaking free and running off. Finally, she chained him to a car tire. It was then that Beetle saw Elena Alexandrovna walking down the street one day. She deliberately turned her head aside, but he gave a huge jerk like a dray horse, and wheezing as he went, dragged the tire around his neck a hundred meters or so before collapsing. After that, Amelia surrendered Beetle. He soon adopted the humane principles of his new owners as a code of behavior. The street dogs no longer went in fear of him, and he began to be friendly toward passers-by, although he was never ingratiating. But there were people in Ushterek, as there are everywhere, who liked to shoot living creatures. Finding no better game, they used to walk the streets drunk, killing dogs. Beetle had been shot twice, and he was now afraid of every aperture that was aimed at him, even a camera lens. He would never let himself be photographed. The Cadmans kept cats, too, spoiled, capricious, and art loving cats. But it was Beetle that Oleg would see in his mind's eye as he strolled along the pathways of the medical center, Beetle's huge benevolent head. Not Beetle out in the street, but Beetle looming in his window. Suddenly his head would appear, and there he was, standing on his hind legs, peering in just like a human being. Tobik was sure to be jumping up and down beside him, and Nikolai Ivanovich would soon be arriving. Deeply moved, Oleg knew now that he was completely content with his lot, quite resigned to his exile. Health was all that he asked of the heavens. He wasn't asking for any miracle. He would like to live as the Cadmans lived, happy with what they had. The wise man is content with little. What is an optimist? The man who says, it's worse everywhere else, we're better off here than the rest of the world. We've been lucky. He is happy with the things as they are. And he doesn't torment himself. What is a pessimist? The man who says, Things are fine everywhere but here. Everyone else is better off than we are. We're the only ones who have had a bad break. He torments himself continually. If only Oleg could somehow see the treatment through, escape the clutches, of radiotherapy and hormone therapy, and avoid ending up as a cripple. If only he could somehow preserve his libido and all it meant, without that. Oh, to get back to Ushcherek, to stop living as a bachelor, to get married. It wasn't likely that Zoya would come out there. Even if she did, it wouldn't be for 18 months. More waiting, more waiting. The whole of his life was spent waiting. No, it was impossible. He could marry Ksana. Her character was firm and her figure roly-poly. Her head was too round, though. But what a wonderful housewife she'd make. Even wiping dishes with the towel flung over her shoulder. She'd look like an empress. You couldn't take your eyes off her. You'd have security with her. You'd have a wonderful home and there'd always be children around. Or he could marry Ina Strom. She was only 18. It was rather scary thought, but that was precisely the allure. Her smile was pensively abstracted, but with an impudent, provocative quality. That was part of the attraction. He mustn't trust the tremors, the Beethoven chords. They were nothing but iridescent soap bubbles. He must control his unruly heart and believe nothing, expect nothing from the future, no improvement. Be happy with what you've got. In perpetuity? Why not? In perpetuity! 
That concludes chapter 20. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, if you have to the Carter Banks Hour, I'd also really appreciate it if you went over to twitch.tv. I'm not really sure how it works yet. I just know that if I stream a certain number of hours, get a number of followers, I think it's 50, uh, have a certain number of listens in a certain number of days in a row, I can become a Twitch affiliate. And uh, what that means for this Carter Banks hour thing that we started, that pretty much means I can keep doing it if I can somehow turn it into a, a graveyard job. I don't know. Twitch affiliate seems kind of cool. So if you go to twitch.tv slash the Carter Banks hour and just exist there for a second or follow it uh, or share it or something, that would be super cool. Uh, in fact, I just got a comment, and it says this book sucks, which I totally do not agree. Uh, that comment was by Unfit8K. I don't even know what that means, but you know what, Unfit8K? You suck. But thanks for tuning in, and uh, I will see you all tomorrow at 9 for Chapter 21. Peace and good night, everyone.